Hello everybody, I'm John Schneider and welcome to Jersey Bayshore Country. I'm your host and today we're going to talk about lifting. Not lifting weights, lifting homes. Lifting them up some 10, 20, sometimes 30, no, not that high. But high enough that they can avoid the floods from any storms that happen to hit the Jersey Shore, such as Hurricane Sandy. I went through Hurricane Sandy with a smile on my face until the water started coming up to my doorknobs and then it was a tragedy for me as well. So today people are wondering, should they lift, should they not lift? Some people are even wondering where will they live? Today I've got a special guest with me, Barry Heffernan, who knows how to lift a house, has lifted quite a few in his time, and is gonna talk to us about it today. Hi. Hello. Well, I, I wanna get right into it because it, it to me it seems like magic. And as I talk to people about this show and about having you as a guest, they said, you know, we don't know how they do it. You know, one day the house is, you know, on the ground and the next day there's this crisscross of, uh, of wooden beams. <laughs> Suddenly it's up in the air. The puzzle, I call it, of lifting a home is understanding how it was constructed. Uh, um, where we're sitting right now, this house is not conforming to a normal space. It is a bump out over there and there's a bay window. So the structure underneath it's got some twists and turns and probably some add-ons. Most of the houses in the shore area started off as bungalows and then they added the, the porch was on it and they closed the porch. And then the front porch became a bedroom. And then, you know, the, the side they added out and they made a bathroom. So the so houses, when you go underneath them, they actually tell you a story about all the things that were added to the structure, which makes it a little more complicated when you lift it because you have to lift it all up very gently. And that's the puzzle of the house. How's it put together? How's it being supported now? And how can we lift it safely to, to put it up at its most its new elevation and uh, have it not protest too much, which is really important. It, it seems to me that the simple way to describe this is that you put two, two beams, uh, usually steel, but they could be something else, I suppose, uh, lengthwise, uh, at, at the bottom of the house, and then you, you lift from the four corners, basically, under that beam until it gets up to where it needs to be, and then you start supporting with, with cinder block, and then you get that other stuff out of there. Is that a simple way to look That's at it? That's a fairly simple way of looking at it, but those beams, the placement of those beams, and underneath the house, the two main beams, the main girders that are lifting the house would be supporting the floor joists, as the house is commonly supported by its floor joists, but underneath the floor joists, there's girders that are running the full length of the house. They're wooden girders. Most of them are rotted. Most of them have seen their storms and Sandy's being the last one. So you're putting the main beams under, but then you're also under your main beams, you're running offshoots of that to carry the front bay window or the side kitchen uh, that was bumped out and put on. So you're actually supporting it in other ways. And then you're building up from the beams to the underside of the house. So when the main beams come up, everything comes up together. So I, I've seen two styles. I've seen uh, steel beams with uh, uh, kind of lifters or elevators or whatever they're called at, at each end of the beam, four of those. And I've seen the, the, the Jenga puzzle <laughs> things that yeah. go up. Are, are there any other types of lifts? Not that, well, I... I understand that some people have lifted with airbags. Oh, really? Which I haven't yet to do, but but uh, they lift many things with airbags, so I, I can understand how it would be done. In the state of New Jersey, the lifting requirements for lifting a house are very specific. Um, so we're lifting with um, mechanical towers, they're 30 ton towers, each one capable of lifting 30 tons. And the main beams that you discussed before, but then as I said, off shooting underneath that is another support system that carries any of the odd things that the house may have. How do you know whether you need to lift your home? When I meet people and they're asking that question, we sit down in their home and I, and I ask them, how deep was the water in here? Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's like a tip off. Well, if the water was above your windows, you know, you've done a lot of work and the house is now rebuilt. Um, are you prepared to leave your house at this elevation and have the flood insurance go crazy on you? That's one question, which it may or may not do. I sure, think that it probably sure. will, given the opportunity. Insurance companies will exploit the exposure you have at the elevation that you're now at. And uh, could your foundation have gotten any damage from the flood? 
Do you find any sagging in the floor that you didn't have before? And you know, it's pretty obvious when you walk into a house and you walk around as a lifter, uh, and as you know, we lift and put the foundation in. Sure. So, so I'm looking at it structurally. When I walk in the house, I'll walk around and note things. I'll say to the owner, you notice it rolls in the back over here. Oh yeah, yeah I see that. Is that new or old? Hmm. Oh, that yeah, that, it just seems to be getting worse. Well, it's a good indication that there's something wrong with the foundation, which you really need to rectify. So, so there's indicators, and I try not to be too blatant about it. I mean, <laughs> all right, if you dropped a can of soup and it rolls all the way to the back corner of the house, yeah, you've got a, an issue. So if, if, I, uh, if I say to myself, I don't want to deal with this flood stuff anymore, nor do I want to pay flood insurance, and I think I want to lift my house, uh, a couple of things are going to come to mind. Uh, lifters are coming out of the woodwork. Which one do I pick? And, and secondly, uh, what's it going to cost? Mm -hmm. And there isn't really a good um, barometer for the cost. I mean, uh, there are a lot of lifting contractors, and, and there are a lot of good lifting contractors. But the lifting contractor is just a small part of this picture. He'll show up, and he'll lift your house, and he'll put it on Jenga blocks, which is generally what everybody does. So then he'll set it on the blocks and he'll leave, and your house is now sitting on the Jenga box, and you're essentially nervous because you're not really sure how much the mason's going to charge or when he's going to get there, and a lot of things become what if. And most people that have gone through this, that have gone with a traditional lifter, they you talk to them now and they wish they had found somebody who could do the whole project for them because that time between the lift and the foundation and the reuniting the reuniting of the house and the foundation, it's scary. So you're, you're, you're saying that there are lifters that will just do the lift and that's it. They Majority. won't do the foundation. They won't do all the hookups again. They won't. Are there some, and maybe you're one of them, but, but are there some that will do the whole ball of wax? There's very few. There's, there are general contractors who would hire the lifter and then hire the mason contractor. Of course, that's different than a, a contractor like myself that we lift it we put the foundation in we set it down we build the entrance and the exit we tie everything together and i take away a lot of the fear that they have because they see us there every day six days a week all right let's lift my studio right now right here uh from the time we shake hands and i write out a check uh how long is it going to take from the time you start to the time you finish and i'm back well that's a good question let's go back to the prep preparation my first question to you is did you have an elevation certificate I don't even know what one is. Okay, so well, we don't know how high you're going to go. So if we don't have an elevation certificate, we can't assess how many blocks it's going to take to fill in the space between where your house is now and where you're going. So the first thing we have to do, if you chose me for a lift contractor, I would give you a generic price. It would, it would not be specific. It would be within 10% probably. But I'd have to hire the elevation, the elevation certificate to be done by a surveyor. And then I'd get that paper, and then I'd be able to refine the price because I'd know how much block is going to take. Now, you're not talking about an enormous amount of money, but for every two feet, you have three courses a block. An average house is 100 to 125 blocks around. So the cost of each block installed becomes, it becomes a bigger number the higher you're off, right? So you're, so yeah, in certain areas I'm used to lifting and I know generally how many blocks I'm going to be going through, and I know generally how close it's going to have to be to the BFE or above the BFE. So I can get the, the numbers pretty good. But back to your question um, about how much does it cost. So the first thing you're going to do, you're going to spend $350 roughly for an elevation certificate. Well, you gave me the deposit. In that deposit, that elevation certificate is covered. In that deposit, I take that elevation certificate, and I go to my architect or engineer, and I use both depending upon the structure and their, their ability to get something turned out quickly, because it's really important to me that I get that paper, that is the drawing for your house lift, come back to you and say, okay, here's what it looks like, and here's where your front steps are gonna go, and is this okay with you? And now, <clears throat> most people aren't very trained with it, so you have to really go through it piece by piece. And now they say, well, yep, that's what I want. So then I take that stamped copy, and I bring it over to the town, and it gets submitted, to the zoning and flood department. And they take a week, two weeks. It depends. Maybe more. Unfortunately, yeah. sometimes it's more. Mm -hmm. um, 
they're only allowed 28 days, and they remind you of that if you bug them. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Don't bug so them. So <laughs> you, 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 you bug them in a gentle yeah, way. Yeah. You go in there with the kids. You make a lot of noise if you have kids. Um, use any tool you can because you really want them to move that off their desk. Sure. Then the next step is you now will have a price because I have a plan. Once I have a plan, you have a final price. And that price, will, you'll be looking at that compared to what I offer offered you and you'll say well you know what I don't want that deck in the back or I want a deck in the back mm -hmm. or I want a bigger entranceway or a smaller so the number adjusts itself a little bit but we're through flood and zoning now we have to go to the building department so in order for that to happen it's time for me to call up the utility companies for them to do their disconnect for you to move out right now the sad part of this situation is that in other states and in this state prior to the lifting law going into effect we could get someone up and back into their house in three to four weeks, uh, connected to the utilities. Mm -hmm. But things have changed. The, um, the gas company is telling us that, well, we'll pull the meter in a week, but then it'll take us three weeks to come disconnect the gas in your street. Mm. And you ask the question, why do you have to disconnect in the street? And it's because they said so. Yeah. And, and so you start feeling frustrated about things that are under that are no longer in my control and I, I really don't know what to do about it I try to shrink the timeline by hounding both the town side and the power company side to, to shrink that timeline down but <clears throat> you're out of your house now and your gas meter has been removed and we're waiting for the for the final letter of disconnect from the gas mm -hmm. and then the electric company of course is notified and they've done their removal they're a little bit better so the powers off your house and now I have a letter that says your house is disconnected. And then eventually I get a letter from the uh, gas company that's disconnected. I turn that into the building department and within, they're allowed 28 days again, but they generally take a week, 10 days, okay. and you have your permit to lift. Now I show up on the job. You've been out of your house for two or three weeks. I wanna stop right there. I've been out of my house for two or three weeks and all of this stuff has taken place. Do, do I have to worry about any of this? Or does the no, lifter, you, well, just people like you have I, to deal I, with in it? In my case, in I your deal case, with you it. Do. Yeah, okay. Because I want hands-on with yeah. it. I want to be involved in the process. I don't want to be waiting for the town to say, oh, and by the way, this permit's right. done for you. Because I have, a, I have a schedule. We work on one house at a time. Yeah. So we lift it. We put a foundation under it. We lower it back down. The lifting crew's going to lift the next one. The masons are finishing up on yours. And then we're on to the next oh, one. So so my timeline from the port that you're out, that is subject to the utility companies. Your cost, uh, at that point in time, you would have given me a deposit, which covered the engineering and the surveying, and now a mobilization cost because I came to the job site, which would be another 10%. So you've got about 20% invested. And assuming that the average is an 80 to 80, $90,000 job for fair size home um, and I'm talking now lift foundation uh, reconnecting it putting an entrance and exit in you can of course every house is different but that's a guesstimate so you've gotten twenty thousand dollars out of your pocket and into mine I lifted the house at that point in time you the owner are responsible for paying me because now I've lifted your house successfully and so theoretically another ten or twenty percent and the contract is very clear because it's a reward system each step I take that I'm successful I received the money. Wait a minute. Did you say eighty or ninety thousand? Yeah, that's what it would cost, generally speaking, to lift. Generally speaking, no. Okay. No. You're making one major mistake. What is that? You're using the word lift. A house lift oh. is not what we're talking about. Okay, you're talking, we're talking you're about lifting your house, putting a foundation under right. it, lowering it, and getting all of you it back in it. All of so it. So you see, that's the homeowner's real cost. That's your real cost. You can find that cheap lifting contractor to come in and lift your house. So then you have all these other things. But that then, are oh, be geez, and, and I didn't. Right, right, and right. and here's one of the common problems. The mason contractor goes, I'm not responsible for your silk plate. The lifting contractor says, I'm certainly not responsible. And then you're saying, well, what do I do? Well, you got to go get a carpenter. Well, no, I didn't figure this in my budget. I got a price from the lifting contractor. I got a price from my mason contractor. Sure. Well, how much is that going to cost? So again, these things are variables, but in my proposal, it's all it's all included. So you've lifted my house, and we've got the building permit and everything. What are the next steps? All right. So after the foundation is done, 
I'm lowering your house down to the new foundation and I'm putting steel underneath it to support the structure as it needs to be. Sure. Then I'm tying it together. Well, at that point in time, there's flood vents that need to be installed. There's either a mud sill or mud, or mud or concrete slab that goes under the house. You need to have an inspection to make sure that the foundation and the house is connected properly. And then again, the calling the building department, as you did for the footing inspection and now the connection to the house. Now you're going to need a final FEMA elevation certificate because you need to prove that you lifted your house and it meets FEMA's requirements. And is this the same? Is this the same guy that did the initial certificate? That's what I. That's what I do. I, okay. When I hire that guy, I hire him for the initial elevation certificate and the final. And the final. Got and it. in fact, a top of block. Got it. Because when we lift, the towns all require that you tell them that you've reached a certain elevation with the top of block because they don't want you coming back and having to relift the house. <laughs> so so there's three things that actually happen. So just to, to fill you in. So now your house is lifted. It's lowered back down. You're going, wow, this is good. Meanwhile, we're building the entrance or the exit, and we're putting in the flood vents, and we're screwing the thing together so that it's bolted or screwed, depending on anchor bolts or hurricane straps, whatever is required by the architect. It's inspected. The pictures are taken. Your final elevation certificate, your final FEMA is done. Now you take that, that goes back to the town, and they'll give you a certificate of acceptance, or uh, in some towns it's acceptance, in some it's a CO. It makes no sense because you were living in the house before. Sure, you sure. It, so why <laughs> couldn't you? But, but be that as it may, it is still, that's the necessary steps. So to complete the thought, your lifting, elevation, your final FEMA elevation, completing the project. That's all part of that circle. If, if a house is lifted and and brought back to uh, being livable again, there are certain things that you can do to a house, regardless of lifting, that will increase the value of the house. Does lifting increase the value of a house in terms of resale? Yeah, pr yes, but exactly how much, I have no idea. Because it's so new, because, it's hard to... Yeah, the, the problem is they don't have comps. They can't really say what the yeah. difference is. But we're seeing... Um, homes that were valued after the storm at 80 or 70,000 that are now lifted with a new foundation that are selling for 220. Well, it would seem to me that it would if, if it didn't increase the value, it would certainly make it more saleable. It's more saleable. Not only that, the flood insurance is no longer going to be a $20,000 ticket or 10,000 or some questionable number. Now, let, let's uh, you, you know the Jenga block method and you know the steel girder method. Let, let's start with the Jenga block method for a minute. Uh, how do they get the house? They put beams under the house, just like the steel method, right? right? But how do they get those up? Do they use the same elevator system that you they, use? They, they, um, <clears throat> they are lifting with a hydraulic jack system, which I also sometimes do. But the hydraulic system they use, it, let's go through their steps, because it's important if you understand it. The first thing they do is they'll cut openings in the floor, and then they'll send a crew in underneath the house, and the crew has to dig down under the house and put the the cribbing, it's called, right? So they have to dig down and put the cribbing. And then on top of the cribbing, they put a jack. And then they lift the house a little bit, and they add more cribbing to it. And then they move the jack. Is the, is the cribbing the Jenga blocks? Yeah. Okay, so each, each stack that looks like the Jenga goes up, there is a jack that lifts that up, yes. and, the, and the blocks are to kind of... You know, as it gets higher, obviously it's the block a can't. Placeholder. It's a placeholder. Yeah, it holds the house as it <clears throat> moves up. I found a lift system in Canada which would allow us to lift a house and not have anything underneath it. And why I like that is I could look at the foundation of my lift system while I'm lifting the home to make sure that there were no problems with the lifting of the home. So everything was flat and level. The other lifting contractors have to go underneath the house. They have somebody's underneath there who's digging and tying the cribbing underneath the house. Now, when that house gets lifted, understand the problem. The house is lifted, and the mason contractor has to dig that new footing around mm -hmm, the house. Mm -hmm. He's got to dig near the cribbing or the chain. Sure, cribbing. sure. When he's digging near the cribbing, he's assuming right. that the lifting contractor's guy who went underneath there very rarely the lifter himself <laughs> right dug it down deep enough 
that it's not going to be undermined right. when you dig that foundation. Right, right, right. So there's nobody that regulates that. You will see where a house fell down or a block moved or something happened when the mason contractor was digging, but very rarely will they go, oh, they weren't dug down enough. Who's faster, Jenga blocks or the steel girder system? Jenga blocks. It's faster? Yeah. Really? Yeah. I, I watch the girders go up pretty pretty quickly, and you're saying the Jenga well, blocks can go quickly? Yeah, they're, they're very fast. Okay. They're, they're very fast, but what I, what I don't like about them, and the reason why I wouldn't use them, is that I like the free span underneath the house. I like knowing that the four 30-ton towers I have are level, plumb, and that if I have a problem at a tower, I can jack the beam up, I can adjust the tower. I have all the control over that lift. There's no variables. When I see wood underneath the house, it's only as strong as the weakest crib. Right. So, so they're... So, they're um, they're they're faster now. When I said that they're faster, maybe not from the time I push a button to lift the house. I'm installing beams that are four times larger than the beams that they're lifting their home with, because I'm spanning and lifting from the outside. Now, whatever method you use, you still have to dig a hole in the foundation lengthwise, and put some kind of girder, steel girder, all the way through, punch a hole the other side. And, and those steel girders have to be on the pneumatic jack system. Right. That's correct. H how in the world do you get... Th these are heavy girders. Do you use a crane? H well, how do you get them through the house? In our case, our girders, just to answer your question, the heavy girders, we're talking about 4,000-pound girders, right? So Those are heavy girders. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the average lifting contractor's beams are probably maybe 800 to 1,200 pounds. Hmm. So they're faster. They slide those beams underneath, right. and they put their their Jenga blocks. In. Okay. And okay. they put a little jack, and they jack it up, and then they add more blocks. And, and then they have a series of jacks so they can start to span higher sure. and higher. Uh, again, I went with the system that I went with because I felt it was the safest system I've found. Mm -hmm. I felt that if I was going to take the responsibility of lifting your home, that I wanted to sleep well. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know that it was done safely and securely and I wanted my people working underneath it not have to worry about it. Tell me, how do you get those steel girders? I know you punch in the holes are easy. We are, how do you get them through? It's not magic. We, we, we have conveyors and we put a conveyor down. Really? And then we take a beam and we'll lift it with a mini excavator or mid-size excavator. And then it'll, the, the conveyor we, will smooth it. We slide it, it on top and oh, we slide it in. Oh, see, I would have never, I would have yeah. never. Conveyors are never thought. But, that, but then how do you get the jacks under the beams? Because the beams are only this far from the ground, right? Well, when they're first down there. Yes. Right? So how do you get the jack underneath that beam in that small space? You, 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 I don't know. You put, listen to you. you I'm going to guess you put a chain or something around it and put it up on the pneumatic jack and start lifting it up that way. I don't know. What do you, nah, what do, you do? What do you do? We just take a hydraulic, a small hydraulic 20-ton jack. A small one. Put a small one, dig a hole, put a bo bo board down, and just jack it up till it touches the bottom side of the house. I got it. And then All we right. put some wood underneath it just to hold it in place. Then we slide our towers in so the beam is now slid right. inside the tower. And then we bring the tower up to engage the bottom of the beam to where now we could lift the house. So do you, do your clients, or the clients of any lifter for that matter, but in your experience, uh, do your clients get nervous about this process of, of someone actually lift? Because all of their goods, all of their pictures, uh, you know, they might they might take a few fragile things and put them in a, in a box, but for the most part, the house sort of stays as it is, and you lift it up, you level everything as it goes, every couple of inches, you put more levels on to make sure. So usually when they open the front door and go in, nothing's broken, nothing's fallen on the ground. Do you have customers that get, or clients that get nervous? I think sometimes I'm a, a psychologist, maybe that might be the term, because they're so nervous. They're so well, I, while I would say that the men are equally as nervous, the women are, you know, it's their home. It's their base of operation. It's their nest egg. It's, you know, it means so much. It means so much in memories. It means so much to them, period. They yeah. were out of it for three months for Sandy. The house was wrecked. It was rebuilt. Oh, my God, I never want this to happen. Now they're leaving again yeah. to let me yeah. lift it. Now, I have had clients actually take wine glasses and put them on the table and fill them with wine. <laughs>
lifted their house. I didn't know. I didn't know they were there. Just to see if they how I, I, did, I did not know the wine was in the glasses. My gosh. Right? So he lifted the house, set it back down on the foundation. It happened to be a three-story boarding house. It was a big home. Yeah. yeah. And um, we went in the house and we saw the glasses, and they were still all <laughs> wine. I mean, it had gotten down a little bit because it evaporated a bit, but um, it was. Uh, people don't have to remove everything. I mean, we're we're sitting here in this seat, John, and that bottle could sit on that thing and we could lift this house. But again, as you pointed out, we lift a house and we concentrate on it being level the whole time. Right. And right. and, and we're, we're taking great care of the home, maintaining its level as it goes up. We don't go fast because we don't need to jar the house. We need to move it slowly and gently and moving it up. And uh, I would say that the pictures on the walls are on the walls. They stay on the walls. Mm -hmm. From the time that we sign an agreement to the time that I can walk up my stairs and open my door and say I'm home is, what, six to eight weeks? I had, um, I've had a lot of success in the past having people back in their house in the shortest two weeks, two days. Really? To the average being between three and four weeks. No kidding. So, yeah. so, so less than a, a month or less. Yeah, it's a month or less. What do you do with a house that has a basement? FEMA requires that that basement's filled in. Is that right? Yeah. You, so what you do is you lift the house, perforate the, the foundation so that the slab that's underneath it has holes and can drain. You bring in common fill. You fill the basement up. Sure. And then you build your... Although a town like Highlands, uh, a lot of the houses do have basements, but many do not. Um, would you say that there are uh, lots of houses still to be lifted? We sort of touched on this a little I, bit. I believe that there's probably, of the houses that need to be lifted, that we've maybe caught 20 to 30 percent of them so far. Yeah. You know, not and Highlands has done a very good job of lifting, uh, but there's a lot of other towns that there's still a long way to go. Uh, Barry, thanks so much for for You're joining right. us on the program, and I want to thank you for watching. As always, if you see me out there in the community with my video camera, I'm flying the drone. No matter what I'm doing, I want you to stop, tap me on the shoulder, and say hello, because nothing is more important than meeting you. Thank you, everybody.